Welcome to The Jay Martin Show. My guest today is Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin. Now, I wanted Andy to come on the show because he recently keynoted at Rick Rule's conference in uh, Florida about a month ago, and Rick said he won the award for the best keynote speech at the conference. The reason is Andy walked the audience through his forecast and how he believes the BRIC nations are much closer to developing a comparable world reserve currency to the US dollar. And today I invited him on to make that argument. So listen to what Andy has to say. I encourage you to pick it apart and leave your comments, questions, or disputes down in the comments. I'll get to them and maybe Andy will too. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. As always, there's a pinned comment or a link in the description where you can sign up for my weekly newsletter. I absolutely love writing it and it's free to subscribe. I publish every Sunday sharing my key takeaways and lessons learned from conversations just like this and plenty others. Here's Andy Sheckman. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, what's up? This is the Jay Martin Show. I'm here again with Andy Sheckman. Andy, good to see you, brother. You too, my man. Thanks for having me, Jay. All right. Now, Andy, you've been talking a lot about the potential development of a replacement for the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency. When I like debate this with a lot of people on this show, they say, look, you know, yes, there's alternatives that are emerging, but nothing's close. Nothing's comparable to the scale at which is required to unseat, unsurp the, the U.S. dollar. Um, however, you covered this extensively at Rick Rolls conference. And, uh, and then I saw you at Economic Ninja and they were trying to give you the award for best speaker, best keynote at Rick's conference, which is awesome. So, so walk me through what you're seeing, Andy, and what you're, what you're talking about. Yeah, I think, I think that pushback, Jay, is legit. Uh, and there hasn't been. Now, Doug Casey, once again, to give him a little bit of credit, he has great one-liners. He calls the dollar the uh, prettiest mare in the slaughterhouse. And I would agree with, with the pushback that you've got until now. So I would like to, to take you and your listeners down a, a rabbit hole, if you will. It may take about 10 minutes, but it's a progression of events that I have seen. And I would, you know, venture to say, you may be the only person that will have heard about many of these things that I'm talking about. Not the only person, but someone who is uh, in tune enough to understand. But when I gave my presentation at, at Rick's event here a few weeks ago, I started out by saying, look, um, I want you to ask yourself honestly, as I go through these mile markers or these signposts that I will show you along the way, how many of these things have you really heard about? And if you Google them, <clears throat> you'll see they're all true, but most people have no idea what's coming. And I think, I think this, is, um, this is what is gonna catch so many people off guard. So let me start by bringing us back to 2017 and we'll go from there to where we are today and, and I want people to think about the comment that Klaus Schwab made, this great reset. And when he said it in 2019, I thought the guy was a, a fool, but the more I think about it, I wonder, was he really? Um, I also would like to start with the premise, and it was similar to our last conversation, and that premise is that the Fed won't get tough on inflation. The Fed has no desire to be written about in history books for blowing up the entire American way of life. They created it. They pointed to a villain with, with Putin in, as being the cause of inflation, when indeed that is not the cause of inflation. Inflation is an increase in the money supply always, and, and coupled with the decrease in production, that is the last three years in this country. No production, increase in the money supply, there's your inflation. And you know Putin and, and the war in the Ukraine may, may be slightly exacerbated price inflation, but has nothing to do with it. So the premise is the Fed isn't going to get tough on inflation, but realizes we are in a bad place. So I'm going to take you down this rabbit hole, and we're going to keep in mind the back of our mind this great reset, and we'll see where it leads us. And I'll let you decide for yourself. So in 2017, we were after, at this point, uh, at, at six years of a bear market in precious metals. And it had peaked in 2011 with $1,915 gold and $50 silver. And from that point forward, slid down a hill for six straight years. In 2017, it was a very um, difficult time to own a precious metals company. And that's, that's when had, I cut my teeth in this industry, Andy. It was right when that waterfall fell off the cliff. <laughs> well, then, then you've got strong fingertips, brother, and you learn to hang on. And that's what we've done over 33 years, real strong fingertips and hang on until you see it change. But 
I'll tell you something. Um, 2017 was the worst year ever to, to own a metals company because at this point, you not only had a stock market that was doing great, you had gold that had slid six years in a row, and all of a sudden you got Bitcoin really starting to take off. And my entire career, if we take 2017 out of the equation, one out of every one or 200 transactions we do are people selling metals. Most of the time, it's the opposite. People are buying metals. And the very, the very nature of precious metals is you hold it, give it to your kids or your grandkids. Most people don't sell. But 2017 was capitulation. People were aggravated because supposedly this new thing called Bitcoin was supposedly cut from the same type of cloth that gold was. And why was it going straight up? And yet gold was, in fact, meandering and going down. At the same time, we had central banks over the previous six years, other than China and Russia and India, the main central banks, the European ones in particular, were all net sellers of gold. And it never made sense to me. So here we are in 2017, and we now take a, a trip down this road, this linear progression of events that in and of themselves, there's a term called the fallacy of composition, where the individual parts in and of themselves are not as significant as putting them all together and looking at them as a whole. And that's what I've done. So 2017, something interesting happened. At the end of all of this selling and capitulation, the German Bundesbank, who had tried for the two years, perhaps three previous, quietly to repatriate their gold from the New York Federal Reserve, made a huge stink of it and said, hey, that's it. We want all of our gold sent back to us this year. Send it back. And no later than 2020, we want all of our gold back. You see, real quick, just as a footnote, um, the U.S. has been holding most of the world's gold because at the end of World War II, we told the governments of the world, hey, we'll hold your gold and we will guarantee that we will pay you $35 an ounce for it whenever you want. Right. So what a lot of these countries did is they would give us their gold, but we would pay them 35 bucks an ounce for it. They would take the proceeds and put it into treasuries. And those treasuries would, would yield a return on a non-interest bearing asset um, and heck, they could always return it for 35 bucks an ounce anyway. That was until 1971. How, how so, much of uh, the, the safety um, opportunity would have encouraged that? Because you've got a continent like Europe, which is continually fallen into war, right? And borders get crossed and countries blow up, whereas the United States huge. dominates the continent coast to coast, with friendly neighbors, north and south. So you can say it's kind of like it's a safe for the world. Yeah, it's Europe. exactly what it was. Not only was it, it was a safe that you could always get your, your gold back for what you paid for, but you were getting a return on something that wasn't yielding a return. It was, that was all of it. And right. of course, in, in at, at the tail end of the Vietnam war, the Gaulle from France realized we were kind of cheating and, and printing more dollars than we said to fund the Vietnam war. And he sent warships to New York Harbor filled with dollars and said, give us back our gold. And, and we did, and we lost probably half of the gold held at the treasury and that is exactly when Nixon closed the gold window, rendering the dollar completely and totally fiat. Now I'm gonna come back to this point in a moment because this is really a very important part. In fact, let's just jump ahead before I continue down this progression and I will ask a question. And you don't have to answer Jay because you probably know it, but most people don't. When I ask the question, what makes the dollar the world reserve currency? Most people have no clue. They say the army, they, they say all sorts of things, military. They, they, no, rarely does anyone understand that the dollar is the world reserve currency because three years after the gold window closed in 71, Henry Kissinger flew to Saudi Arabia and said to the Saudi kingdom, we will protect you and we will provide you military assistance. We will provide you munitions. No one will ever mess with you again. But for that privilege, OPEC will denominate oil globally in dollars, period. And, and for the past 50 years, that's been the case. We have protected the Saudi kingdom. And for that privilege, oil has been sold exclusively in dollars, literally, for the past 50 years. Now, I'm going to stop right here because this is where the pivot happens. But let's go back. 2017, the German Bundesbank says, give us back our gold. And we did. Finally, they got their gold back. But within a few months of that happening, Jay, the Bank of Austria, the Bank of Hungary, Bank of Turkey, the Czech National Bank, uh, the Dutch National Bank, all of these banks said, give us back our gold too. 
not just from the New York Fed, but also the Bank of England. And they all wanted their gold repatriated. Now, the interesting thing about all of these banks, the majority of them, with the exception really of Germany, are banks in the European Union who have for the last six or seven years been massively accumulating gold, but they're the ones that don't trade the euro. They're in the union, but they all trade their own currencies. This is significant also in a moment. But the bottom line is you have all of these banks that say, hey, give us back our gold. Now, the following year, those same banks bought more gold after being net sellers for years previous, bought more gold as a group than they did in the 60 years previously combined. And so now all of a sudden you have banks repatriating their gold and going on a buying spree. Now my attention is really starting to, 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 to get peaked. And uh, it's hard not to notice this because it had been a complete 180 degree turn. 2019, those numbers are up 100%. So you have massive, massive gold accumulation. And in 2019, the very first biggest event of my career happens. Most people don't know this. And, and I think it's by design. But the Bank of International Settlements, who's located in Basel, Switzerland, they are the, the central bank, uh, central banker's central bank. They reclassified gold as the world's only other tier one reserve asset. Now, let me say that one more time. From 1944 until 2019, there's been, as far as central banks are concerned, one tier one reserve, and that's been U.S. dollars and treasuries, a riskless asset. Now, out of nowhere, they say gold's tier one. Why did they choose gold? You know, everyone always in my industry said it would be a special drawing rights from the IMF, which is uh, 195, 200 countries from around the world that would contribute uh, and coalesce and form a a, a, a new special drawing rights that, that could be issued in replace of the dollar to give it uh, uh, if there were problems with the dollar or a tier one asset like a special drawing rights from the IMF. Well, that didn't happen out of nowhere. They raised gold to a tier one status. Now, do you think the front running by these European banks and the accumulation, the repatriation had anything to do with knowledge that the BIS was going to reclassify gold as tier one? I would argue it was that they take care of themselves. Can you, can you tell me what is, what is the significance of that? So what is the significance of the BIS raising gold to a tier one asset? Because it is the only other tier one asset in the world. It is a riskless asset. Um, and it is, in other words, used for collateral. It is something that on their balance sheet um, is on par with cash. And you know, for all of the years prior to that, gold was a tier three asset which meant only 50% of it could be calculated on a balance sheet, which would undermine the, the ability to sell, uh, sell bonds or to transact international business. This is one of the reasons why until that point, the central banks were selling it because they figure, hey, it's tier three asset, it denigrates our balance sheet, costs money to store, pays no interest, let's sell it, buy treasuries, get a return, put it in equities, get a return on all of our, our, our central bank funds and then out of nowhere, they reclassify it tier one. Now, this is a very, very, very big deal. They're basically calling it as good as cash. Um, never had that before. So now things start to get really, really interesting. Um, also in 2019, we see something starting to rear its head. Signpost number two. Most people don't know about this. The Chinese Belt Road and Rail Initiative. Um, it's the largest infrastructure project in human history. It's the Panama Canal on steroids. It is connecting, it's Asia's way, China's way of connecting Asia, Africa, parts of Europe, the old Silk Road. And Jay, you have to understand that this is 75% of human population. Um, this is 45% of global GDP uh, before industrialization. And almost all of it is settling on the new Chinese digital yuan. So you have all of these contracts settling on a new system usurping the dollar. Almost 20 billion in successful transactions, let's call it a beta test for the new digital yuan, have already been transacted. Even through the Winter Olympics in Beijing, they are using this new digital yuan to settle the contracts that is en encompassing 75% of human population in the United States is not part of it. Very, very, very big deal. I'm going to put all these things together for you in a minute. So 
now things are getting really interesting. Um, and again, common theme of, um, in my opinion, you're starting to see a theme of de-dollarization, massive accumulation of gold and repatriation, remover of, removal of counterparty risk, and then infrastructure programs that are, are, are surrounding the majority of human population, and yet the dollar is not part of it. The dollar is being left out of it. 2020 comes along uh, and we see the rise of the others that I mentioned on your last show. The others are a group of traders that are now listed on the COMEX Commitment of Traders report that were never there before. They are believed to be sovereign wealth funds and family offices. In 2020, these others took more silver off the COMEX market than we had seen in the previous 10 years before. They took more gold off the COMEX market in 2020 delivered off of, take possession of, which is highly unusual, never happened before. Typically 1% of these contracts would settle for delivery. They would always cash settle or roll over. And now all of a sudden you're seeing extraordinary large decade uh, sized withdrawals off COMEX and silver. They took more gold off the COMEX market than the Bank of Japan holds in their official holdings massive drawdowns. Now things are really getting crazy because not only are the central banks repatriating their gold and buying it, but now you have the most sophisticated, well-funded, well-informed private investors on the planet doing the exact same thing. So very, very interesting. And also in 2020, we see further requests for a new system when the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which coincidentally was formulated at Bretton Woods in 1944, comes out publicly on their website and says, we want a new system, a new Bretton Woods, let's call it. They wanted a new Bretton Woods and set it right on their website. So you have 200 countries from around the world saying, we, we want a new dollar system or a new Bretton Woods. So this common thread of pushback and pulling away from the dollar is becoming more and more and more accentuated. But it really starts to get crazy in 2021. Um, 2021, we see massive gold accumulation by Russia, Turkey, um, uh, Thailand, Hungary, Kazakhstan, Japan, Brazil, um, Poland, China, of course. They're all massively accumulating gold in 2021. But signpost number three happens September of 2021. And I view this probably as the very biggest signpost of all, and that is the day we left Afghanistan. Now, if you grew up in the United States, um, Jay, what happened in Afghanistan is something that never would have happened in the country that I grew up in. Um, and as a patriot, I am a true patriot. Um, I was embarrassed at that moment to be an American. Um, I was embarrassed for our country. I was humiliated by the actions of our administration who left soldiers behind enemy lines. That would never happen in the country that I grew up in. And not only that, we turned our back on our allies, people who fought for us, who had friends who died for us, Afghanis. Not only did we leave them behind when we promised them we wouldn't, we turned over their biometrics to the Taliban. And so you're talking betrayal at the ultimate level. Now there is no coincidence in my mind to the announcement, the timing of this announcement. And this is where things start to get really real. And that is that the day we leave Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia announces a joint military cooperation agreement with Russia. Now, wait a second. Wasn't it the United States protecting the Russia that, or excuse me, United States protecting Saudi Arabia that gave us the dollar hegemony, that gave us the petro status? Could have sworn that it was. The day after that, Nigeria makes the same announcement. We're now being protected by Russia. The day after that, in the Zero Hedge article, Russia comes out and says, we have outfitted all of our nuclear-powered submarines with hypersonic ICBMs. That was their way of saying, don't mess with us the way that you did with Hussein and Gaddafi. The day after that, the State Department releases a, a, a an article saying they are very concerned about this new technology. These are the missiles that fly up way up in the atmosphere and go Mach 10 and hit the ground at the speed of an asteroid, can't be knocked down, and we don't possess the technology. They came out in public and said, we're very concerned about this. <laughs> this is something that um, is, is troubling. So 
Now we're, we're at, at, at looking at things in a very different light. Uh, what gives the dollar its world reserve status is the protection of the Saudi kingdom. And now all of a sudden we have another big kid on the block who is, who is stepping in on our territory and protecting the Saudi kingdom. Subsequently, we have now seen Nigeria come out and declare that they are selling their oil to China for yuan, a yuan denominated bond called the Petro Yuan bond. This bond um, is denominated in yuan, but it is immediately convertible into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Saudi Arabia came out and said, we're contemplating doing the same thing. And if they say we're contemplating, they're doing it. So they're selling their oil to China for a yuan denominated bond that they can immediately convert into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And this is why I believe, Jay, that the Shanghai Gold Exchange has delivered upwards ends of 90 to 100 times more gold over the last few years than the COMEX market has. This is how countries like Iran, who, by the way, just joined the BRICS nations or said they are on pace to join the BRICS nations, um, that's how they sidestep sanctions. They sell their oil to China for the yuan denominated bond and immediately convert it into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange and take possession of it. So things are starting to get really, really uh, concerning. 2022 rolls around <clears throat> and we see Russia kicked out of SWIFT. Mm -hmm. And my question to the public is, was this intended or was it not intended? Because our leaders, they have to understand the consequences, whether it being intended or unintended. And that is, if you weaponize the dollar as the world reserve currency, and I would argue that it is not our privilege to do that. If we weaponize it and tell the world who can and can't use it, most of which believe the West is hypocritical in these, in these statements, and we sanction them and freeze their assets, what do you think a country like China, who has sold 120 billion of our bonds over the last seven months, thinks? When they're looking at Taiwan, all of these other countries are thinking, hmm, are we next? What we did by doing that was incentivize de-dollarization, I believe, to uh, exponentially increase, where we push Russia right into the open arms of the Chinese and their SIPS system, which is the cross interbank payment system. It, it mimics the SWIFT. Uh, we have incentivized the world to move away from the US dollar. Now let's look at what's happened since then. Since then, we have Turkey coming out and say they wanna buy Russian energy and use other currencies like their own currency other than the US dollar. We've seen um, India, where their largest trading partner came out and said, uh, domestic and international transactions will be uh, priced in rupee now, not in US dollars. We've seen Russia make unilateral trade agree agreements with India for selling armament and, and purchasing energy in rupee and rubles. We're seeing all of these agreements moving away from the US dollar. We have seen what I believe uh, is really the very frightening things, and that is Egypt and, and Turkey saying that they want to join the BRICS nations. We saw Saudi Arabia come out a, a month ago and say, we are contemplating joining the BRICS nations. Now, here again, when you say contemplating, it's done. And if you think our president, who hasn't even had the balls to go to the Mexican-Texas border, fly to Saudi Arabia to beg for oil when we are openly blowing up their way of life by going green and moving away from combustion engine and fossil fuels, he didn't ask for that. He went there to beg them not to join the BRICS nations. We saw Russia and China just come out and say, arm in arm, Xi and Putin say, we are now issuing, the BRICS nations are now issue, issuing a coalesced currency to challenge for world reserve. This was just a few weeks ago. You're seeing all of these countries coalesce against the US. Now, let me put it all together for you because I think that when you, um, when you put all these things together, they, they make a, a very compelling argument. And then I'm gonna ask you to put it in reference to the, the Great Reset. So if we take a look at everything that we've seen and encapsulate, first we see 
uh, repatriation of central bank gold out of the Western vaults. We see massive accumulation by all of the countries from China, Russia, India, and all of the European countries, mostly the Eastern European countries. These Eastern European countries, I surmise, will break from the Eurozone <laughs> and they will join the BRICS nations. These are all the countries that do not trade in the Euro, but are part of the European Union, such as uh, uh, Hungary and, and Turkey and, and Poland and the Czech Republic and, and all of these, these countries. We see the Belt Road Initiative, the largest infrastructure project in human history, which encapsulizes 75% of human population and the US dollar is void of all participation. We see a digital yuan where 75% of, the, of human population is being indoctrinated into a new currency that I believe perhaps will challenge for world reserve. Maybe not the digital yuan, but maybe the conglomerate that we'll talk about in a moment. You see deals being made between all of these major powerhouses in energy that is usurping the dollar. You are seeing the dollar hegemony break because now Saudi Arabia is being protected by Russia. Nigeria is being protected by Russia. Nigeria is part of the Belt Road Initiative, also being protected by China. You see all of these countries, including Venezuela and Iran and Algeria, Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia all either join the BRICS or say we are on our way to joining the BRICS. When you put all of these countries together, you're talking almost 90% of human population, all moving away from the US dollar. You look at who the West is, Canada, the US, part of Europe and Japan, they're all insolvent and or completely broke. They are all based on a system of of debt instruments. What did Zoltan Pozar just say? The former head of, uh, of the repo market guru and, and, and not the head of, but a member of the New York Federal Reserve. We are entering Bretton Woods three, he calls it, which is a system dominated by commodities. Now let's try and put all of this really together. Um, when Klaus Schwab said, there'll be a great reset and you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. I thought it was foolhardy, but let's put it in perspective. Over the last three years, they've printed more currency um, than the entire history of the United States before it. Um, they have uh, blown up the, 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 the asset prices incredibly by all of this money at the lowest interest rates in human history funneled its way into stocks, bonds, and real estate, where distortions and misallocations and resources and capital created no price discovery, where homes can double or triple in a year, where equity portfolios can double or triple in a year, where cryptocurrencies can go up tenfold. Everyone feels wealthy in this environment. Everything is great. And then what happens? You weaponize the dollar. You push Russia out of SWIFT. All of a sudden, you see a coalition of countries that represent almost 90% of human population moving away from the dollar, striking agreements, actually coming out and saying, we're gonna issue a new world reserve currency. You see the, the linchpin of the dollar hegemony, Saudi Arabia, who is now being protected by Russia, selling, saying they're going to join the BRICS nation, selling their oil to China for the yuan denominated bond. How does it all blow up? Well, this is how it all blows up. And this is why I think inflation becomes a massive problem. And remember what I said earlier, the Fed ain't gonna do anything about this. But what if they're behind it? What if they knew that by trudging down this road and weaponizing the dollar would set off or catalyze a series of events by pushing Russia out of SWIFT and taking everything, making the whole world say, are we next? Are they gonna do this to us? I know China's thinking that, with their eyes set on, on, uh, on Taiwan, they're not going to buy our bonds anymore. How does it all blow up? Here's how it blows up. Saudi Arabia joins the BRICS nations. And by the way, before I even finish this, think of the, the RICs and BRICS, Russia, China, India, South Africa. They're the largest producers and accumulators of gold in the world. And so I want you to understand when we talk about the digital yuan, which has now done a beta test for three years, four years, uh, to, to the tune of almost 20 billion in transactions. What if all of these countries who are coalescing pledge gold 
to a new distributed ledger technology that has already been beta tested that works. And, and what if that new BRICS nation's currency, as Zoltan Pozar says, actually is pegged to gold? Now, it won't be convertible because de Gaulle from France proved that convertible currencies convert. But what if they use distributed ledger technology to peg gold, maybe 10 or 15 percent of every new BRICS currency, pegged to gold with the immutability held on the distributed ledger? So let's take this one step further. How does it blow up? How does the U.S. go to a great reset? How does the West experience a great reset? It's very simple. Saudi Arabia stands up on the podium with the rest of the BRICS nations arm in arm and says, hey, U.S., thank you for the memories. It's been a wonderful ride. Um, we appreciate all you've done for us over the last 50 years. But we have decided now as a new member of the BRICS nations being protected by Russia, being protected by China, we have decided that we are going to open up oil purchases in multiple currencies from yuan, rupee, ruble, <laughs> gold, euro, and US dollars, and maybe a few others. If you realize that every single country on the planet Earth has had to own dollars for the last 50 years in order to purchase oil, creating a synthetic demand for the dollar, creating what is called the petrodollar. Most of these countries despise the West, have no intention or desire to own US dollars, but have been forced to in order to buy oil. So what happens? The dollar becomes a hot potato. The dollar starts getting dumped by one nation after the next, after the next. And then it's like trading places where where, where one of the Duke brothers says, sell Mortimer, sell, because the price is collapsing. The dollar is being dumped globally as it no longer has to be held for energy settlement. And as it's precipitously losing value, as it's being sold, other countries will follow suit to not get kneecapped by the fall of the dollar. All of those dollars collapsing come home. This is pillar number one of hyperinflation. Those dollars come collapsing home, driving the dollar down, collapsing the dollar and creating hyperinflation. What happens to interest rates in that moment? They go to the moon. When you have hyperinflation, you have to have massively higher interest rates to compensate for the loss of purchasing power. Stocks, bonds, and real estate are inversely correlated to what? A massive rise in interest rates that the Federal Reserve doesn't want to mess with. So how do you have a great reset? Saudi Arabia comes out and says, we're done taking just dollars and we're opening it up to all these other currencies because the infrastructure is in place, the relationships are in place, the, the coalescence the, the, the coalescence of 90% of, of human population is together and they are going to issue a new currency. And I would argue, why did they go gold, tier one asset in gold? Why did they classify gold as tier one? Who's the biggest accumulators and producers and importers of it in the world? Oh yeah, the BRICS nations are. They are, and it's now tier one. And hey, we got a beta test of a new digital currency that, that works and distributed ledger technology for the whole world to see the immutability of all of the gold and commodities that these BRICS nations are going to pledge to a new currency. And when that happens, bang, the dollar collapses, interest rates spike, stocks, bonds, and real estate vaporize in a matter of minutes. There is your great reset where everything has been blown up to ridiculously high levels. And when rates spike, everything collapses and the Fed can stand back and say, those sons of bitches, those BRICS nations blew everything up. We would never did this. We were trying to get tough on inflation, but what did they do? They created hyperinflation. They ruined everything for us. And everyone in the United States who feels wealthy in their 401k and in their home um, and, and, um, and their bond portfolio overnight is leveled down to a common denominator. And that's exactly how fragile this entire ecosystem truly is. So going back to the very first thing that you said to me, I agree, there is not a single currency on the planet that can rival the dollar. There is not an economy that can rival the dollar. Now that economy in, in many respects has been um, uh, manipulated by keeping interest rates low and, and increasing a Fed balance sheet from 800 billion to 9 trillion. You take that out of the equation, it's not so robust, but it's still better than the rest. 
But you put all of these countries together, the BRICS nations, 90% of human population, all the commodities, and the desire to break free of the Western hegemony, all it takes is for Saudi Arabia to say that, and overnight, it becomes a religious experience in this country as rates go to the moon, the dollar collapse, and the inversely correlated assets to rising rates collapse at the same time. This is what my biggest fear and my biggest concern is, and this is why I believe that the Fed probably understands what's going to happen. And if they let this happen, they have now found a villain to do the dirty work for them. Because, Jay, we have $130 trillion in funded and unfunded liabilities at the lowest interest rates in human history, accumulated at. We cannot pay it off. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago. The game is over. It's just a matter of how it plays out. And I think the Fed realizes, and the government, that it's either death by inflation or death by depression if they're the ones driving this, this fix, this, this solution. But if the market does it for them, it's like ripping a Band-Aid off at the speed of light and everyone is going to go through the same pain at the same time and everyone will point to those, those BRICS nations did this to us instead of focusing on who really created this problem. That's the Federal Reserve. Interesting. Andy, that was a phenomenal rant, man. I love it. Uh, I was writing down questions as you were going, but then I, 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 a couple of times I jumped in. I didn't want to do that because I know when you're in flow like that and you're sort of banging through point after point after point, I don't want to take you out of flow. Um, I guess, you know, so one question that I would come back to you then is if you've identified Saudi Arabia as being that match, right? Gasoline's everywhere, right? What's going to cause the eruption? It's Saudi Arabia raising their hand and saying, yeah, we're changing teams or we're changing the rules. You know, yes. it's less obvious to me that Russia has the competency and influence to supplant um, the United States as their protector. Um, I would look at maybe how things are going in Ukraine and the disorganization of that military. However, I understand incentives again. And who's Saudi Arabia's biggest client? It's China. Who are you going to take care of? Your biggest client every single time. You watch out for your own livelihood at the end of the day which leads me to some of the other countries you spoke about, like Egypt, right? We're debating joining the BRICS nations. I agree with you. They don't, they don't produce any grain within Egypt, and 25% of, the, of which comes from Russia and Ukraine, which is now coming through Russia. And so if you're out of food, where are you going to go, right? You're going to go to your new best friend who can supply it to you, right? And accept the consequences that may come along with that. I also wonder the same about the Western European countries. You Look at a country like Germany who can act tough today and say, we're going to wean ourselves off of Russian oil and gas. It's like, OK, yeah, how are you going to do that in November? Right. And when push comes to shove, they're going to ask the same question or their citizens are that Egyptians are asking, saying, look, where's the energy going to come from? I don't care about history. Right. We need to heat our houses. So maybe it's time to change friends here. Right. And where are they going to go? And so, you know, I'm really curious if as soon as this winter, we actually see, you know, a true shattering of the Eurozone right? Because people are going to look out for their immediate needs, right? If you can't put, you know, food on the table tomorrow or heat your house tomorrow, you're not worried about long-term consequences. Where do we go today to eat tomorrow, right? And a lot of European countries are going to have to answer that question. Norway, I think they import 99% of their natural gas from Russia. Like, good luck finding an alternative. It doesn't exist, right? It's been fascinating. What do you think about that? I think I think it's you're spot on. And if you look at the majority of the Eastern European countries that have been accumulating gold, again, these are the ones that do not trade in the euro. I think you will see a breaking up of the European Union. Absolutely. Not only that, their currency, their economy, I mean, it's in free fall. So, yeah, I think that you will see that you will see a changing of the guard, a changing of the teams. And to your point about Russia, you're right in a conventional war maybe they don't have what it takes, but they do have enough deterrent with their hypersonic missiles to where I don't think that we would ever want to get into a, 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 a boots on the ground war with Russia um, or um, going in and trying to overthrow the Saudi kingdom when they're part of the BRICS nations. So yeah, you're right. You know, Russia might may not be, um, may not have the capacity to protect Saudi Arabia the way that we always have, but they have the deterrent. And I think that's enough to make, I think I think everyone who grew up in the United States in my generation, who remembered and previous uh, doing um, nuclear uh, bomb drills where you would go and, 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 and put your head underneath the desk 
in elementary school remember the the, the terror of having this impending cold war uh, uh, escalate. No one wants to go to war with a country like Russia. And it's one thing when you start to bully, you know, countries that don't have the ability to fight back. But it's another thing when you're dealing with a country that can and would if push came to shove. When you coalesce all of these countries into a BRICS conglomerate, it becomes a whole bigger deal altogether. And so, yeah, I think that you will see more or less these countries changing teams because they have no choice. And I, I think that's really where we're going to, to move to. Um, may not happen today, may not happen tomorrow, but the, the, the direction of this is moving absolutely in this direction. And I think they're moving away from the West, the debt, the lies, the hypocrisy. Um, I think most countries on the planet don't like the way that we have maintained and fostered the world reserve currency. And I think a lot of people around the globe are, are willingly embracing change. And that change would be a rallying cry against all of this. And I think Europe is not immune to it. In fact, I think most of the countries, maybe even Germany that I spoke about would be inclined to move in that direction. For sure, Hungary and Poland and Turkey and the Czech Republic and all of these countries that have been incredibly incredibly amassing gold 10 times year over year from 2019 to 2020 on most of those countries, I think their incentive to break away from the euro uh, and move into a system that is dominated by commodities, that is, is um, um, free from the Western um, hegemony is, is something that seems to me impending. I think it's coming and, and you can see it by by the relationships that are being made and and the the trade agreements that are being made that are largely conspicuous um, and, and void of the dollar and the dollar participation. Now, is it kind of and I, I get that and you know you gravitate or you migrate away from the US dollar hegemony and all the hypocrisy and you know but but is that kind of like out of the frying pan into the fire. I mean, could you expect any world leader to operate differently in that position? And if you're changing team from the West to the East and therefore your superpower moves from the US to China, like it's not like you're jumping into some massively authentic, transparent, you know, civil rights uh, favorable, like, you know, it's, I guess you got to do what you got to do in the moment, right? Well, and maybe that is part of the allure of the Chinese digital yuan where you have, mm -hmm. Um, immutability of this new currency and this new system with commodities pegged to it. Is it just gold? Is that why they raised it to tier one status? Don't know. But let's say it is. Now you have a currency that has gold pegged to it with the immutability and the veracity denoted on a distributed ledger for the whole world to see. So while we may not like the fact that they're um, a little bit weaker, shall we say, on human rights and things that we, the West, embrace. On the other hand, um, they are a more realistic um, system, a currency system, an economic system that has a tether tied to it with complete and total trans, uh, uh, um, what am I trying to say, being complete and totally transparent, uh, where you can see the pegging, the value, where inflation is held in check, where, where people's standard of living would flourish because it's not being denigrated by increasing high inflation. And I think if you ever want people to drink the Kool-Aid again, it has to be tethered to something. And, and this is probably why you saw gold well in advance of this happening, reclassified tier one and take a step back from that and say, okay, they classified a tier one, Two, three years before that, the central banks are copiously accumulating it, repatriating it, and that's a trend that we've seen continue to this day. You know, they say, well, the U.S. doesn't buy any gold. Well, I would say, where did the $12 billion in gold just disappear to that Ukraine sold to fund their war? Where did Hussein's gold go to? Where did Gaddafi's gold go to? Did we take it? Did we know that this is coming? Is this our way of accumulating gold? I don't know. There are a lot of I don't knows, but there is also... Uh, Occam's razor, and that is the most logical explanation prevails. And the bottom line is, is that when you see this coalition of all of the world, 90% of human population moving away from the West and the debt and the hypocrisy, um, 
I just think that it becomes more and more inevitable. And I think that this has been sped up by the weaponizing of the dollar and kicking Russia out of SWIFT. Look at the pieces that are in place, okay? You have, just from the Chinese perspective, first you have the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which could take the place of the COMEX. You've got Russia, who just came out and said they want a new precious metals hub, a center that they want to put in Moscow to, to accurate, re, accurately reflect commodity prices. You have the Chinese petro yuan bond, which uh, certainly has been working for uh, the purchase of energy. You have the Belt Road Initiative, which is 75% of human population before industrialization. You have the digital yuan, which has been beta tested for three years. You have this massive infrastructure um, internally and externally that I believe is setting the stage. If, if we're playing chess, you're almost a checkmate. You're surrounded. And so um, you, you throw into it the loss of the Petro status and it's checkmate. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, a lot of this, most people wouldn't think it's even possible. Um, but I think if you take a step back and look at, at the actions that have already happened, um, it becomes more and more probable that something along these lines is already in the works. And um, you throw into the mix the fact that these countries involved own the lion's share of all the world's commodities from um, oil. Look at Saudi Arabia and Russia. That's probably number one and two. Natural gas, fertilizer, gold, silver, platinum, palladium. I mean, go down the list. Rare earth metals. The BRICS nations own them all. Yes, there's a lot of untapped stuff here in the United States. I'm not going to discount that. Maybe the best thing that could ever happen would be, you know, for, for North and South America. Well, you can throw South America over to the BRICS because you already got Venezuela and Brazil in there. So maybe the best thing that could happen would be for, for United States and Canada to close their borders and just simply become a, a more um, controlled uh, group where we exploit the natural assets that we have. Um, don't know if that'll ever happen or not, but hey, not our I current think, leadership, but honestly, I don't think it's right. the worst. Yeah. I mean, given the. No, given well, the that's state. what our founding fathers told us to do stay out of everyone's fears. We'd be better off protecting our borders instead of letting millions of people come in illegally uh, and, and tightening up the ship and using our resources instead of, you know, how did they bring down the price of gasoline over the past couple of months into the midterm by selling the strategic stockpile of? Of, of, of oil that we hold. I mean, what good does that do? And some of it they sold to Pakistan and China. The decisions that our leaders are making are fostering this de-dollarization. And that's why I wonder, is it intended? Was it intended or unintended? I would argue it's intended. You have to be an idiot to not see what kicking Russia out of SWIFT and sanctioning and stealing their assets would do from a big picture. And I, yeah. I think, I, I just think that the infrastructure that the world has set up um, it is enough to, um, to me, solidify that this is already in motion. Uh, route open up. It's called the North-South Corridor, and it's it's safe passage from Iran to India through past Russia and. Everyone else has, has to go around the Straits of Hormuz. I mean, you're talking about massive infrastructure being set up, relationships being set up, uh, digital currencies being set up, energy agreements being set up, all of these things being set up and the U.S. is not part of it. So when that switch is flipped, um, what happens to the value of the dollar? What happens to interest rates in response? These are all things that I think are baked into the cake. And so... This is why I believe so many people are ill-prepared for what's coming because no one's even heard of the majority of these things. No one even knows that Russia and Saudi Arabia struck a joint military cooperation agreement. No, Most people don't know about the Belt Road Initiative or that gold is tier one or that the central banks are accumulating it or that the biggest money in the world is pulling metal off of COMEX, the LME, and and. And 100 million ounces backdoored by the commercial banks off of SLV last month. All of these things put together, say one thing, de-dollarization, moving away from the dollar. And they're using the manipulated prices of the world's commodities as controlled by COMEX and the LME to run cover for it. 
And at some point, and we're getting close to it, when you see Russia say it's time to break free of the COMEX and the LME and their fraudulent system, we're getting real close to that point where they go bang. Now the price goes to the moon in all of these assets. Do you think there's any wonder that JP Morgan, while paying a $920 million fine to the Justice Department for manipulating the market, has accumulated the largest physical position of metal the world has ever seen? Do you think there's any coincidence? In fact, they've accumulated over 1.1 billion ounces of silver and over 35 million ounces of gold while paying this fine. And they're still allowed to be the administrator of the world's largest silver trust, SLV. Talk about a fox guarding the hen house. The biggest money in the world already knows what's coming. They're cued into it and or clued into it. And I, I think that um, I think the probability of something along these lines happening is greater than it's ever been. I never even thought about this, but put it into context of what Klaus Schwab had. That's I had to say, that's all it would take would be for the dollar to lose its petro status and all those dollars to come flooding home. And just like that, interest rates spike to the moon as a result of that inflation. And it's a whole new ballgame. This is when the U.S. comes in. They default. They issue a new digital currency, their own, um, a new Fed dollar, and they probably peg it to gold themselves. And that's <laughs> when you have a splitting, a splitting of the, of, of the world where you have the East versus the West. Man, that's a whole other conversation we need another hour for, but I would love to jump into that Fed coin the probability of it. I know 100 countries are working on their own CBDCs right now, Canada included, Payments Canada is on their website stating they're, they're working on this. I have a lot of questions about that and, and honestly doubts, um, first and foremost, because uh, there's never been um, a scaled out, highly efficient technology platform produced by a government. And so why would they get it right this time? I, I just don't know if they have the competency. I, I don't understand the philosophy behind it and the incentives to do so, but I just don't know if governments are the ones to execute on that program. I could be wrong. Look, I mean, you said a bunch of things about, you know, people don't think this is possible. And I think that's a totally reasonable and rational understanding, right? It's, it's reasonable to expect tomorrow to be like yesterday. That's why we get surprised by bubbles in the stock market, not necessarily just because of greed, but because reasonable people who see a 10-year track record might assume we'd see an 11-year track record. That's a reasonable thought. And to assume that we're going to see such a, um, a dramatic, great reset of our way of life and living and transacting is very hard to wrap your mind around. You know, it reminds me of a Luke Groman quote, and I love Luke because he's not really a gold bug, but he'll say... There's very few points in history where you want to own gold, but at those moments, it's about all you want to own. And, you know, I'm kind of like, I'm a bit of a gold bug at heart, a bit, you know, and, and I like to just slowly accumulate hope. I never need it, intend on leaving to my kids. But, you know, in that scenario, it's, and to your point, like it gives me the confidence to sleep at night. That's what it does. For me. That's what my gold holdings do for me is give me the peace of mind to know I have that insurance policy that honestly can't be fucked with. Like it's, it's there for me when I need it. Well, I, I think a lot of the world is thinking that, you know, I talk about these others, these reportables on Colmex. Yeah. Um, so far this year, these others have already taken almost 105,000 contracts in gold off of Colmex and delivered. You're talking 325 tons of gold, over 10 million ounces of gold has been delivered this year alone by these sovereign wealth funds, these family offices. In the past month alone, we've seen 100 million ounces taken out of SLV. Uh, 60 mil, uh, excuse me, this is the past four months, 60 million over the past month, 20 million over the last week. The, the SLV is being drained by the, the, by the, uh, the, the participants, the qualified participants who are able to do that. And you know, central banks alone have added 60 tons of gold to the reserves last month you can see that the price of metal is a tool of misdirection, that the biggest money in the world is using this price, this, this suppressed price to drain the centers of physical metals. Gold is leaving the COMEX at the fastest monthly pace ever in the history of the COMEX market. And, you know, I think that you have to take a step back and realize that in a, in a strong and healthy environment where there isn't problem, problems on the, or there aren't problems on the horizon, you don't see things like this. You don't see massive, massive drawdowns of metal quietly. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just think that 
the stage is being set for something, something big. And what that is, I guess, is debatable, but you can certainly see it is because, look, the ideal of every nation is to be able to print as much paper as it wants, but at the same time, keeping inflation in check. And I wonder how the hell do you do that? And um, you lie about inflation. And this is what all all governments are doing. And, and I think what is the antidote to that? It's a distributed ledger technology with a pegging, a commoditized pegging to it. And it just seems to me that that, th that this group, this BRICS nations, realizes that that is their path to, I don't know if I want to go as far as saying world domination, but certainly competing for world reserve with the West. Yeah, well, I, that's a very reasonable and realistic expectation. Look, Andy, um, what do I have to do to get you up to Vancouver at my conference, January 29th and 30th? I'll, I'll have to get you back. Say the, say the word, I'll be there. I'll, uh, I've always wanted to go. I will be there. I'll come in a week early, go skiing up at Whistler and uh, come with uh, bright eyes and bushy tail to uh, speak at your convention. I would love it. Awesome, man. Well, okay, I'll send you the details. Let's make it happen. It'd be awesome to uh, square off live on stage, bring some more people into some cool panel discussions. It's a blast, man. Okay, cool. I Look, would love to. Thanks so much for taking the time today, Andy. This was a blast. And um, and I feel like I'm going to have to rewatch this interview to pick it apart a little bit. And then I'll probably end up firing you questions via email. But anybody watching it, hit, hit up the comments with questions. Anything Andy said or you're unclear on or you want to dispute, leave it in the comments. Uh, I'll be in there. And um, and maybe Andy will too. So thanks again, Andy. Appreciate your time, man. Jay, thank you, brother. I really do appreciate it. I will look forward to picking up where we left off, hopefully not too far down the road. All right, thank you for watching this interview. Now, three things before I let you go. Number one, I publish a weekly newsletter and I love writing it. I share my biggest takeaways and action items from the conversations that I have on this channel. In addition, my thoughts on current events, economic events, political events, and you can subscribe for free. Just hit the pinned comment right beneath this video or just go to jmartin.club and you can subscribe on the website. I'd love to have you join the team. Number two, ad revenue from this channel is donated to an organization that is super close to my heart called Zero Ceiling. Now, Zero Ceiling's mission is to end youth homelessness. And the way they do this is by giving at-risk urban youth the opportunity to relocate to beautiful wilderness areas and then provide them with supportive housing, career training, and just generally positive influences on their life. I love what they do. Check them out if you're interested. And number three, if you prefer to listen to my content as opposed to watch it, you can find me wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search for The Jay Martin Show. All right, thanks again.